Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's panel. Um, we're going to give folks a couple minutes here to trickle in. Um, so make yourselves comfortable, and we'll get started in just a few minutes. For those of you just joining us, we're going to get started in a couple minutes. We're going to let folks trickle in as we turn on the webinar link. So just sit tight one second and we'll get started. All right, we're gonna wait probably 30 more seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, please everyone, let us know where you're from in the chat. Um, you can also open up the chat and ask any questions throughout the presentation to any of the panelists and we'll either get back to you in the chat or we'll save it for the Q&A if we think that it's um, best to discuss as a group. So feel free to use the chat to get in touch with any of us today. All right, well, I think we're gonna go ahead and kick things off. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Drew Slattery and I'm gonna be your moderator and host for today. Um, thank you to the AgriWeb team for putting this webinar on. We're very much looking forward to it. I am the program manager for the Trust in Beef program at Trust in Food. Trust in Food is a division of Farm Journal that is um, designed to empower the American producer on their continuous improvement journey and to help them adapt to a changing market and a changing world. Um, so I'm, we're gonna start with a quick round of introductions to our panelists before we dive into our content today. Um, Kevin, we'll start with you and then Patrick will go to you um, for intros. Awesome, thanks Drew. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining. My name is uh, Kevin Baum, I'm the CEO and co-founder of AgriWeb. Um, we are a company that builds software solutions for the ranching space. Our focus is on using technology and using data to drive improvements in, in margin and profitability um, and sustainability across the ranching industry. Um, and so I'm, I'm originally from a technology background, um, but I have two co-founders that are fifth generation ranchers. Um, we started this company in Australia, but we've uh, moved over to the US in the past two years uh, and are really excited just to, to be here and, and thrilled to have um, Patrick and Drew uh, joining us. Thanks, Kevin. Patrick, you want to give us a quick intro of yourself? Yeah, thanks, Drew. And uh, thank you all. And thank you, AgriWeb, for having CattleFacts be a part of this, uh, this webinar. Um, CattleFacts, for those of you that aren't aware, um, we're a cattle market um, information uh, you know, company. And we really work on helping, um, helping producers navigate, you know, navigate all these markets, um, stay on top of all the new and changing information and really sorting through all the noise as far as, you know, what's, what's the need to know um, pieces of information and, um, and working through all the volatility that, you know, we have, uh, have no shortage of here today. Um, myself, I cover, um, I cover our membership uh, in the North Plains and the West areas um, of the country. Um, and then also do, you know, quite a bit of work, um, you know, building out our, uh, building out our, information systems as far as you know what what are our forecasts um, and building that foundation for you know we we believe you know as as my outlook will show that the markets are going higher but how much higher and how do we navigate around that so thank you all for being here thanks patrick kevin i'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to you i know you've got some interesting research that you all have been doing over the past few months um, that you're going to share with us today so I won't steal too much of your thunder, but please let us know what you all have been up to. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, look, I'll, um, I'm just gonna take a few minutes here um, before, before Patrick in the main event. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, my, my two co-founders at AgRub come from, from five generations of ranching. So 
Um, you know, when we started this business, one of our core values is always around living for the rancher, um, which means that everything we do across the business, we, we always cross-reference it with, are we adding value back to our customer, our core customer, the producer? And so that, that starts from how we look at strategy, how we look at product, but also, you know, these kinds of events, and these kinds of activities. We've been running uh, webinars this whole year in the U.S., uh, and the goal is just to make sure that we're we're talking about topics that are interesting to ranchers, uh, getting awesome guest speakers like Patrick on, um, you know, especially now at the end of the year, um, you know, just to just to add value and make sure that we're getting discussions uh, happening across the industry with producers around what are the most relevant topics. So we'd love to get feedback on on topics people would want to see and, and discussions. Um, but in addition to webinars, we also are are trying to to find other ways, um, you know, to create value. Uh, for the ranching industry. And one of them is on uh, collecting information. One that we've done recently is, is about collecting information from ranchers on, um, you know, what are the trends and uh, what are the big challenges and what are the big uh, focal points looking into 2022. Um, so we recently ran a survey. We got over 750 ranchers um, from across the world um, talking about their businesses. And um, what I'm going to share quickly is just just some of the few early conclusions. We're still we're still processing the data, and the plan is to uh, release this report to anyone who's interested um, in January next year uh, with a lot more detail. But as sort of a lead into this discussion, many of the topics we're going to talk about came from what people are saying and what people are asking in this report. So I'm going to quickly share my screen here and just run through a couple of um, a couple of short conclusions. So let's see, make sure this works. Um, can everyone see my screen all right? Drew, Patrick, are we good? Looks okay, good. Okay, awesome. Perfect. Um, so the first thing uh, to look at is, is, you know, what are people prioritizing? What do people care about uh, when they're looking at their business? Unsurprisingly, um, you know, the key is profit. Um, nearly everyone we surveyed is, is very focused on how do I improve profit uh, into next year, uh, followed by, you know, operational efficiency, herd efficiency, and then uh, improvements in, in grazing strategies. Um, again, not, not probably a whole lot that's terribly surprising. Um, and the, chal the challenges side, it, it's quite similar. Um, you know, I don't think anything, these are probably the, the same big four challenges ranchers have been talking about uh, you know, for, for our lifetime. Uh, first and foremost is how do we improve margins? The, the number one thing that a rancher has control over is, is profit. Um, and so what can we do? as an industry to maintain or improve profit margins. Um, then come some of the things that there's a whole lot less control over. Um, you know, price, the price of meat, uh, the consolidation and the power of, of packers uh, and ultimately drought and weather. And again, I, I doubt any of this would be a surprise to anyone on this call. Um, so what we wanted to look at, and, and again, we'll, we'll be pulling more conclusions out over time, but we wanted to look at that is what are some, where could we go with this? What are some of the the interesting insights around what people are doing or what people are thinking about doing to address these challenges. Um, so the first one, first and foremost, is what do we do about margins? Uh, and looking into the data from our producers, the number one thing they're, they're thinking about when it comes to margin uh, is around uh, grazing strategies. Um, we had a huge percentage that are either currently or thinking of engaging in more innovative grazing strategies. And there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of talking points. There's a lot of media around um, you know, grazing strategies and regenerative grazing. Um, but what we're seeing from, from these producers is that it is having a huge impact. 92% uh, of them reported um, either some or a significant improvement on the quality of their land. Uh, and 84% of them uh, you know, saw that actually uh, filtering down to the bottom line uh, and improving, meaningfully improving profitability uh, and margins. So, um, there may be a lot of talk and hype, but at least, um, you know, within this survey, it seemed like there's a lot of impact that's happening from reconsidering grazing and, um, you know, uh, getting more sophisticated on, on what's happening there. Um, you know, the second conclusion we drew was uh, the second big concern was around pricing uh, and, and the you know, lack of control over prices. Uh, I think that's a concern that's on every rancher's mind. Um, and one of the ways uh, that, that ranchers in this survey are attempting to address that is through, um, you know, value added programs, direct to consumer marketing, uh, trying to shift away from commodity beef um, into, um, you know, different strategies that can help give more control over the top line. We saw that 
40% of the producers surveyed were, were already engaging with these programs, uh, and 30% more are looking to be engaged soon. Um, so this is definitely a trend we want to dig in more, and I believe Patrick's going to be talking a little bit in the next session about you know, how you can get more, more value for, for the produce. Um, and also, interestingly, we found that those that are in these programs, it's, they're, they're still concerned about prices, but ultimately less concerned, and, and they're 15% less likely uh, to consider price a top challenge you know, when engaged with these programs. So um, certainly not out of their mind, but, but at least less of a concern uh, as some of the others. Um, and then finally, obviously, as a technology company, um, you know, and not just uh, us as a software technology, there's a lot of technology all around there in agriculture, and a lot of it can be noise. Um, and so the question we always want to know is how can we apply technology to add the most benefit? Uh, where is technology helping? Um, and then another interesting fact for us was that while 57% while of the respondents were using technology uh, to improve their animal management, and only 43% we're using it for grazing management, almost 96% of those involved in those value-added or direct-to-consumer programs are using technology. Um, you now, technology is never the ultimate answer, uh, but it does seem that um, you know, for those value-added programs where there's a huge benefit to the top line, there's also a huge cost, uh, and it can be painful uh, you know, to deal with the compliance side and to deal with the requirements of those programs. Uh, it would appear that many are turning to technology as one way to help out. So again, just some, some quick early um, you know, uh, insights uh, on what ranchers are saying and what they're seeing and what they're looking for um, into 2022, uh, ways they can improve their business uh, and how they're trying to handle some of those big challenges around margins, um, prices, and weather. And um, so I think that you know, that kicks off, um, I'm gonna turn it over to back to Drew and to Patrick now. Uh, to get into a little bit more detail about, uh, you know, about what what's going on in the markets um, and what ranchers can do, um, you know, to help battle some of these challenges into 2022. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Patrick, while you're getting set up there, just a reminder to everyone who's joining us today, if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat um, and we'll be happy to answer. You can also message directly if you don't want everybody to see what you're asking. Um, and we, we can answer those for you and we'll save um, some of the good ones for the Q&A there at the end. But Patrick, you're up next and you're going to give us um, an outlook on what we're looking at um, for 2022 in terms of both U.S. and global cattle market drivers. Um, take it away. All right, can see, you can see your screen. slides perfectly. All right, perfect. Well, thanks again, um, you know, for having me. And, you know, I think you know, a lot of these items that, uh, that Kevin touched on um, fit perfectly, you know, with this discussion. And, uh, and we made sure to incorporate those in the discussion today because um, not only, you know, not only did they show, you know, resounding interest in the survey, um, as we saw, but, you know, we believe that as we look at the marketplace and look at the global environment, that those are a lot of the key points that we need to be aware of as we go forward. Um, so with that, we'll just dive into the discussion. You know, we have to start this discussion, I think, with drought. And, you know, for those of you that, um, you know, that have weathered through some of these conditions over the last year or, um, you know, many, many folks that still are, um, I don't need to explain how bad, um, you know, the drought situation has been for some folks. Um, you know, thankfully, some of these areas, um, you know, have improved in terms of conditions. Um, at one point, we estimated that there was, you know, over 30% of the nation's cow herd that was um, in drought type conditions. Um, you know, we have seen where that's improved somewhat here lately, um, but still you know, sitting there at you know, still a substantial number of cows um, that are sitting in drought. And we've also noticed that more recently, um, as we know, that drought pattern has shifted um, more into the Southwest and touching into some of the Southern Plains areas um, the Northern Plains, Panhandle of Texas, um, and out through Oklahoma, um, and up, you know, into New Mexico and some of those areas there as well. Um, so as we know, you know, while some areas have seen improvement, still plenty of drought conditions out there and in creeping into other regions. Now, as we look forward um, into the weather forecast and, you know, what are our expectations here going forward, um, you know, these are uh, these are slides you know, that we've pulled from uh, the meteorologist that we use. 
And you know, as you can tell, um, as we look forward, our, the precipitation forecast um, on the left-hand side, winter on the top and into spring on the bottom. Um, you can see that, that we're seeing um, you know, some, some relief through those um, northern areas um, and portions of the west, uh, northwest in particular. Um, and, it, and as you think back to that drought map, um, you know, areas of Montana, quite a few cows in that area, um, seeing some relief as we work through the winter. Um, but unfortunately, uh, as these La Nina conditions peak, um, and it does you know, see some improved conditions you know, through the northwest corner of the country, um, we're also seeing some more dryness creeping in, you know, continuing through the southwest and southern plains. And essentially the same message as we continue on through spring. Northern half of the country, uh, wetter than average, and then the southern, um, southern half to uh, roughly on the drier side of things. You know, um, there is that suggestion uh, and the talk um, from the different meteorologist groups that this La Nina should begin to break down and flip into um, an El Nino type pattern. Um, as we work some point through 2022. Um, but these forecasts would suggest that we don't see that La Nina um, pattern really breaking down um, you know, until you get roughly halfway into the, uh, into the new year. So unfortunately, that, that means that, um, that we may not get quite those adequate spring rains that we might be hoping for um, through many portions of the country, um, in particular the areas here um, that are flagged as drier than average. You know, as we look, flip the script a little bit uh, and touch on the grain complex shortly, or real quickly here. Um, you know, this is looking at an annual range uh, and, and forecast uh, for spot corn futures. So as we know, the last year, um, you know, feed grain prices, corn in particular, uh, have been significantly higher than what we've been used to. And as you look at the chart in front of you, you'll notice that, um, that what we've seen is corn will tend to settle into ranges um, for a number of years. And, and a lot of markets will tend to do that over time. Um, and that'll be a theme that I think that I'll touch on through a number of these, uh, a number of slides that we'll look at. But as we look um, over our shoulder, we've been pretty well, um, pretty well lulled to sleep by a corn market that's been predominantly in a 325 to 425 area um, for the better part of half a decade, or for the better part, uh, you know, quite a few years here. Now, we believe that we're transitioning to a new and higher trading range um, on the corn side of things that we'll likely settle into um, for a period of time. Now, exactly where is the top and bottom of that range um, has yet to be determined. But as you look towards our 2022 forecast, we would suggest that on average, prices will be lower into 2022. Uh, excuse me, my drawing tool likes to act up on me sometimes. Um, but nonetheless, still at elevated levels um, compared to what we've been used to. Now, as we'd see things, you know, the, um, the ultimate highs that we saw um, so far in 2021 uh, during this summer, you know, we don't expect that we're going to revisit those highs. And on average, again, we will be lower, but still nonetheless supported at higher levels than what we've seen for the past few years. And a number of things, you know, driving that is we have tightened up corn supply, you know, stocks to use down below uh, 10%, um, whereas we've been sitting above that benchmark um, for quite a few years. Um, higher ethanol demand, expect that will continue in particular um, as we see an elevated um, an oil, elevated energy market um, and also you know, stronger exports than we've seen. Now, we do expect that China will be a less aggressive buyer and where they've driven so much of this increase in exports um, won't be as aggressive here going forward, but nonetheless still be supportive. Um, as you look across the rest of the grain complex, um, they'll all be supporting each other. Um, you know, wheat in particular through the northern portions of the country, um, competing for some of those, uh, for some acres there. And then uh, soybeans through uh, many other portions of the country. 
And as we look forward uh, with these higher fertilizer uh, costs that I'm sure you're all very well aware of, um, we'll support that we'll need to see higher grain prices, um, or at least from the future side of things, to incentivize and buy those corn acres, um, encourage the farmer to plant, just as they're looking at higher break evens um, with their input costs higher than what, uh, than what they've seen. And would note from the cattle side of things as well, you know, that does mean that those 75 to 80 cent cost of gains um, you know, in the finishing yard, likely behind us as well. Uh, you know, cost of gains, you know, roughly in the, um, you know, to place one on feed, somewhere in the dollar 10 uh, to 15 area um, for a lot of cattle today. So looking at higher values there or higher costs um, from that side as well. Another supportive factor, again, as you mentioned, um, energy prices. And as, from a producer standpoint, another thing we need to be keeping on our radar. Um, as you see here, you know, regardless of which energy source you're looking at, um, expecting that prices will be generally higher uh, than what we've seen for the past few years. Um, so something that we need to be keeping an eye on as well. Um, yeah, our forecasted range uh, doesn't have oil uh, getting to or has it topping out at $92 per barrel. Um, but there's also plenty of groups out there suggesting that, uh, that oil could hit $100 per barrel. Um, you know, not necessarily going to make that our forecast today, um, but something that we need to continue to watch. Now, again, thinking about this from the consumer side of things, um, also rough math would suggest that every dollar that retail gasoline goes up, costs a family of four, uh, $500 per year uh, in, terms of their, in terms of their bills. So just another thing that we need to you know, keep in mind you know, as we work on through the future um, and think about in terms of beef demand and you know, the price sensitivity that the consumer might have. Now, as we look towards the inflation side of things, um, you know, it's, it's uh, no secret to anyone that prices are going up um, pretty much across the board. Um, the latest inflation data uh, in November showed that prices were up 6.8% um, compared to a year ago. Uh, and that would be the strongest year over year increase uh, since June of 1982. So these are pretty aggressive numbers and certainly much higher again than this plus or minus 2% inflation that we've all been used to uh, since we've worked out of the financial crisis. And so as we look going forward, you, know, you see the forecast here does show a pretty sharp decline. And this is, um, and this is based on you know, what we've seen from a lot of uh, macroeconomic forecasting groups. But you'll notice that even as it declines, we're still looking at some pretty rapid inflation um, for the next few months. And noting that you know, as you get towards the second half of next year, uh, if this forecast were to hold true, you're still posting, call it a 2.5% increase on top of this 6.8% that we've seen here this year. So certainly suggesting that, that uh, the inflation's not done. And as we look going forward for the next few years, um, we would hope that inflation does settle down as we get past this amount of money that's um, been in the system supported by um, central banks and governments across the world, um, and also these supply chain issues, but still don't really expect that we'll be returning to that 2% inflation area um, for some time or for the foreseeable future. Now, from a producer standpoint um, and from a, from a beef producer standpoint, these inflationary pressures will also, should also be supportive to beef values. Um, on one hand, it does make the consumer potentially more price sensitive as they're seeing you know, the other parts of their budget go up in cost. But again, they're, they're becoming mentally trained um, to accept some higher prices um, regardless of where they go. So, um, so a bit of a two-sided two conversation there, um, but certainly you know, as you look at beef prices um, on a retail basis, they have been part of this inflation picture. Now, as we look going forward, 
Um, this looks at industry profitability uh, from the cow-calf producer um, on through the packer. And it's important to recognize that, um, that while the cattle producing segments um, haven't seen their share of profitability um, that we'd all like to have seen through the past few years, we are in a notably different environment that we've been in um, it, that we've been in you know, prior to the 2000 timeframe. As you'll notice, total industry profitability averaged essentially $32 per head um, for two decades. And that's when we saw a massive liquidation of the beef cow herd. And at the end of the day, that's when we were producing um, a quality of beef that was just nowhere near what it is today. The transition going forward today, 83% of cattle are grading choice um, or better. And the consumers responded and increased their demand for our product. So we're in clearly a new environment where, um, where there is more margin in the system. So what this suggests is that as we look over the next few years, it's easier to see upside in our forecast for prices on the cattle side uh, across the cattle segments because that demand is in the system. It's not something that we have to go and build. Um, unfortunately, again, it hasn't been um, on the producer's side for the past few years, but it is nonetheless in the system and makes it an easier transition um, through the next few years. Now, this chart looks at beef cow slaughter. Now, as we've seen, even pre-pandemic, we had started to see an increase in cow slaughter. Um, again, these tighter margins um, that we've seen, again, partially just cyclically, um, as we have, you know, have had larger cattle supplies um, for the past few years. And then you transition going forward, uh, these drought conditions today uh, that we've seen this year have resulted in a 10% increase in beef cow slaughter. And then you've also seen a 3% increase on the dairy side as well. Now, we should see that start to decline again as we get uh, hopefully past a lot of these drought conditions as we work into the second half of next year. Um, and then also as the profitability picture improves, um, hopefully start to flip that expansion switch and start to see beef cow slaughter decline. So you know, with that increase in cow slaughter that we've seen for several years, the beef cow inventory has declined and contracted. And that that message, that story was in place, again, even before we got into, uh, into COVID. Um, you know, from 19, from January 1 of 19 into January 1 of 20, you know, we did already see a decrease in beef cow, in the beef cow inventory. And so that, that liquidation was already underway. And as you look at our forecast here, you know, we expect that we'll see a decline in the beef cow slaughter for the new numbers that we'll get as of January 1 of 2022. And then we're expecting that these drought force conditions um, likely added one more year uh, from what we know today uh, to this liquidation phase. Um, a lot of heifer retention decisions or, or lack thereof potentially this fall, um, baking in the cake that we'll see another decline in the beef cow herd into 2023. And certainly, you know, the drought forecast, uh, the weather forecast favors that decrease as well. Uh, and we'll have to be, you know, monitoring and we'll adjust this forecast as needed, you know, depending on the severity um, of the weather conditions, you know, through the next few months. But nonetheless, suggesting that, um, that we do have, you know, at least another year or two um, of contraction to beef cow inventory. Uh, before the profitability signals um, suggest that the industry uh, starts into the expansion phase into the second half of the decade. You know, a little different trend on the dairy cow side. Um, you know, slow and steady increase uh, versus the cattle cycle on the beef cow side. And that's the slow and steady increase um, over the last 20 years uh, with the dairy cow inventory. Um, adding roughly half a million head sent over that time frame. Now, as we look going forward, we are seeing some elevated um, dairy cow slaughter uh, recently and, um, and compressed uh, margins on that side. But we do suggest that we'll likely continue to see this, this general trend of a larger dairy cow herd 
um, through the next few years. You have global, uh, global and domestic demand for milk, milk products, and, and domestically in particular, cheese, yogurt, um, remain, remain very strong. And again, global demand uh, as well. Uh, milk and milk product exports have been record strong this year. And then also, as you think about these innovations uh, in terms of the beef on dairy cross, um, where the dairy producer takes, you know, call it the bottom half of their dairy herd and breeds them to AI bull sires. All of a sudden you're increasing the value of that calf as well, pretty significantly. And you're changing that dairy cow um, from just a milk product producer to a milk and beef product producer. Now, yes, that steer calf um, may have already existed, but what was a straight Holstein steer before uh, is now a higher quality beef product. Um, and a lot of the consumer research and the meat, uh, meat quality research suggests that. So I think that long-term trends like that suggest that we can continue to see growth on that dairy side. So as we mentioned, uh, the beef cow herd is in a contraction phase and steer and heifer fed cattle supplies. Uh, and as you see steer and heifer slaughter, will tend to follow that beef cow herd trend by you know, a one to two year lag, um, just as you think about those cattle working through the system. So as we look over the next few years, um, we should see where slaughter continues to trend lower. Um, you know, again, see a few more cattle showing up on the dairy side, but not offsetting uh, the decrease that we're seeing um, on the beef cow side or on the beef side of things. And recognizing that, hey, this uh, decline that we saw into 2020, um, that supply was already there. It just, you know, as we went through the plant shutdowns, we weren't able to harvest those cattle. So they moved into 2021. And that so much of that reflected and caused you know, this sluggish market that we've seen so much of this year um, up until here recently. But again, towards the next few years, should see declining slaughter numbers. Now, in terms of carcass weights, um, you know, the long-term trend is that carcass weights grow. Um, long-term average, about five pounds per year, as you see on the chart in front of you. Now, we do expect that, again, with these big weights that we've had all year, um, we'll likely see a decline next year um, you know, with feed prices, you know, maybe not, you know, maybe softening on average, but still being higher than what we've been used to. And then again, on a year over year basis, um, seeing weights come down somewhat. But nonetheless, expecting that um, the longer term trend you know, will remain higher as we get a few years down the road. And in particular, as you think about things like genetics, uh, improving on the lower end um, of the cattle um, should favor that we could still continue to, uh, to see that uptrend over the next few years uh, in general. So with the decline in slaughter and a decline in weights, you know, we're anticipating that US beef production should be down roughly 2.3% um, roughly next year, um, following record large numbers this year. So again, and that'll lay the foundation for the price forecast that we'll get into later, that this decline in beef production um, should have a pretty clear impact on price as well. Now, as we look at things globally, um, exports have been extremely strong. Um, China, the big growth factor this year, um, whether you look at China in, by itself uh, in the light blue line or the greater China area, uh, if you say, what about um, imports to Hong Kong, Vietnam, um, some of those other areas as well, still very, very strong uh, and record large export numbers. And at the same time, we're seeing those more traditional trading partners, uh, Japan, South Korea, also remaining strong uh, and posting uh, a record large number for South Korea and very near record for Japan. Um, and as we look going forward over the next few years, expect that you know, we'll continue to see that, that global demand for, uh, for our product, in particular, as the world uh, continues, the world economy continues to recover from uh, 
you know, from the economic slump due to COVID um, and global demand for protein continues to increase. Yeah. As you look at things, um, you know, the global population, again, will continue to increase. So that does favor that places you know, like the United States producing um, a high quality um, beef product and being one of the major producers does suggest that the longer term export trend should continue to work in our favor. Um, exports this year on pace to be up around 20% on the year. And our forecast would be is that we'll see another 5% growth into 2022. And mind you, that's a more modest growth pace, but it's on top of record large numbers uh, this year. And also expecting that um, at least through the first half of the year, um, as Australia continues to uh, to recover from their drought um, that they've had um, several years ago, that will be limiting to imports um, in the near term. So continues to see a more favorable uh, balance of trade uh, in terms of the product that's on our domestic market. And that has a direct impact on, again, net beef consumption or net beef supply. How much product um, you know, is left on our market for domestic consumption? And you can see um, the significant decline, nearly two pound drop um, from 58 to 50, uh, 56 pounds per person into 2022. And as you look back historically, um, not many years below that uh, in terms of net beef supplies. Now, as we look, step back and look at it from a macro standpoint, uh, and this rolls together U.S. beef, pork, and poultry production. You know, while beef will be lower on the year, uh, as you see here, um, we also see steady to slightly lower pork production and a small increase on the poultry side. But nonetheless, total U.S. Um, meat and animal protein production remains, you know, even though it's slightly smaller, near record large levels. And so much of that export growth or that, that, uh, that growth is facilitated by exports. Again, um, talking about a, gro a growing global population and more importantly, a growing global middle class does suggest that across the proteins um, should continue to see export growth um, you know, across the spectrum. And so with that, you also see a decline in total, uh, total meat consumption or total net meat supply um, on a per capita basis here domestically. Now, I would note that you know, as we think back towards the last cycle, um, when we pushed, um, when we worked out of the last drought um, and net beef supplies were extremely tight, we pushed beef to record high levels and killed off demand. What'll be different is during that time frame, we didn't have competing protein supplies to keep us honest, to prevent our prices from getting too high. But today, our total protein supply, um, it's smaller, but still elevated. So as we think about um, you know, the risk going forward of pricing ourselves out of the market, um, you know, luckily, you know, we don't have that type of situation today um, because beef, you know, continues to have some competition out there um, to prevent prices from getting too high. And as you look at things um, here at the retail level, yeah, this looks at beef in the blue, um, poultry in the red, and pork prices in green, and compares their change since January of 2018. So you can see all three prices, um, as we all know, increased pretty significantly, uh, especially since the start of the pandemic. Um, and all of them pushing to at or near record highs here in the month of November. But again, as you see, as you compare, you know, beef has continued to post the largest increase, but again, the other prices, um, other you know, competing proteins have increased right alongside with it, uh, are pretty close. Now, as we look at things from a demand standpoint, so prices have moved higher but, and, and will continue to be strong, but how do we look at that in light of these smaller supplies? 
Uh, and so as we look at this benchmark, it continues to suggest that beef demand is extremely strong at the consumer level. Um, you know, pushing to a record high uh, index number of 139 this year. And we do expect that we'll see a decline next year. Um, you know, it tends to be that as you push to a new record high, you see a small pullback the next year. Um, pretty common historically. But still that 134 index is, you know, our retail price would suggest for next year, still extremely strong beef demand. And thinking about, you know, the quality of the product that we've built, again, 83% choice or better and 10% prime. The consumer continues to reward that, uh, that quality that we've built in the product uh, with their dollar. So as we back down to the wholesale level, uh, looking at the composite cutout, um, you can see our forecast for next year is essentially um, is essentially flat on the year, and you know we could see where um, wholesale beef prices even come down a little bit from this year, but even so, that's after a 19% year-over-year increase in 2021 and an 8% increase um, during 2020. So still remaining at very strong levels. Now, as we think about the allocation of those, uh, those retail and wholesale dollars, um, it's important to recognize that you know, stepping back um, or looking back over our shoulder, you know, we've been restrained as we've had, uh, as we've had cattle supplies. Uh, looking at the red line here is weekly average uh, steer and heifer slaughter. It's exceeded what our packing capacity has been for the past few years. An estimated five to nine percent more uh, more fed cattle than available hook space over the past few years. Again, as we we rebuilt the cow herd coming out of the last drought, but packing capacity didn't keep up. You know, as we look going forward, this should change pretty significantly. As I've outlined, uh, cattle fed cattle supplies will be declining. And we also have heard so much of those, those announcements of adding an increased uh, packing capacity. Uh, some of those already scheduled um, to be online and, and to start coming online in the second half or fourth quarter uh, of next year. Um, and we, but we've already seen you know, some small additions here and there throughout the country. And you know, with all those additions um, that have been announced, our forecast, as you see here, is penciling in that roughly half of those announcements um, work out um, to completion. So even taking that conservative estimate, you can see the increase in packing capacity that we have at the same time um, as cattle supplies decline. So this should set us up for a huge shift in leverage where, um, where cattle supplies or the cattle producers dollar um, significantly rebalances compared to what we've seen the past few years. But, you know, it is important again that, that uh, we get the, that, those packing capacity additions and see them fulfilled. That way, again, if we hope to expand the cow herd into the second half of the next decade or this decade, that that capacity is there um, when we get there in terms of fed cattle supplies. And we don't run into the same situation that we've seen uh, here over the last few years. Again, with that rebalancing uh, in terms of cattle relative to hook space and packing capacity, sets up for a change um, in leverage position. Um, the fed cattle proportion uh, of the wholesale beef dollar, um, we have forecast to increase um, by about five percentage points next year. And as you look over the next few years, that should continue uh, to increase as well. A yeah, simple way to think about this benchmark is that um, with our 280 uh, wholesale beef price forecast, every 1% change in this metric is essentially $40 per head um, at the fed cattle level. So you know, if you think that um, we'll be shifting leverage more significantly yet, um, you can see the impact on price across the cattle segments that that would apply. Um, but this is our forecast here today. So what this equates to uh, is we, we're projecting that 
Um, after a 122 average fed steer price this year, uh, we'll move up to around 140 next year um, with a forecasted range of somewhere around 130 uh, to 155. Uh, expecting that yeah, this normal seasonal pattern uh, will be at play. Uh, we'll, we'll push to a spring high uh, you know, somewhere you know, this spring, call it around a 150 mark. Um, and then you know, see a pullback into the summer. You know, could see risk again down close to that 130 mark um, before pushing higher and likely pushing to a new high in the fourth quarter uh, sometime around this time next year. Um, call it around a 155 mark. Again, pretty significant year-over-year -year increase. And as you look back historically, moving prices uh, to on an annual average basis, uh, the third highest that we've we've seen on record. So, uh, and we've started to see this transition pretty clearly over the last uh, last two months or so. Um, cattle prices, you know, lower last week and again here this week so far, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, that's after an $18 per hundred weight increase um, over the course of just six weeks. So starting to see this pretty clearly take place. Now, Within that, um, also continuing to see a lot of differentiated value uh, and, and premiums for those cattle that, again, hit the quality benchmark. Uh, this chart looks at you know, those cattle that are marketed on a grid, um, how they net out um, you know, based on quality grade. So you can see 80% choice. Um, those cattle on average bring back a $50 bill uh, compared to the negotiated cash market um, whereas as you continue to work down on quality grade, the premiums narrower and narrower. And then those under 35% choice, um, high select grading pens, you know, face a pretty significant discount. And I think what's important to note as you look at this chart is that we've continued to pile more and more cattle into that high choice bucket. But as we've done that, the premium has stayed stout. Um, continuing to just reflect that growing demand uh, for quality. And at the same time, not very many cattle fitting into that under 35% choice bucket today, but even as there's not very many of them, are facing uh, a fairly stiff discount. As we transition on down the supply chain, uh, look at uh, feeder prices um, you know, or for the yearly market basis, an 800 pound feeder steer. Annual average, uh, we're forecasting uh, for 168 average next year, uh, with call it a 158 range to 184. And expecting that again, within this annual average, you continue to see that seasonal pattern where the lows are likely, you know, in the first uh, the first quarter of 2021 or 2022, excuse me. And then you continue to push on up towards that higher end of the range as you look towards August, September, October next year. On down to the calves, uh, expecting that on an annual average, a US basis, a 205 average. Now, we do know that nobody sells an annual average, US average uh, calf, but as you look at the year over year increase uh, with this benchmark at 170 this year and bumping up to 205 this year, you would suggest that whichever type of uh, calf you're selling, on average, it would be roughly $30 per hundred, $30, $35 per hundred, higher than what it was last or this year. Uh, expecting that again, likely this low of 170 is probably where we start into the year. Uh, and where we start into the year is probably the low for the year. And you continue to move on higher through the spring uh, chasing those few lightweight calves. Um, they're ideal for, uh, for, for grass turnout. Um, and then you do see pressure, see a break into the fall run, but um, as you always do. But again, basis this benchmark, could see where, um, where a, two of, a $2 area could be pretty strong support even through the fall run. Now, looking at cows, uh, recognizing that coal cows you know, are also a significant source of income for the producer, expecting to see them higher as well. Um, as we see you know, cow slaughter start to decline, as we mentioned, 
uh, especially into the second half of next year, that will be supportive of price, as you see in the red. Uh, increasing to $72 average next year uh, with support down around a 62 range. So, you know, with these things in mind, these trends that, uh, that we we're anticipating, I want to throw at you a few considerations uh, as we do, you know, work into this, into this bull market, um, these higher trend in cattle prices and tighter cattle supplies over the next few years. So from a macro standpoint, and stepping back, the trends across all classes of cattle, uh, and this is looking at, you know, from the beef complex, fed cattle, uh, feeder cattle, down to calves, prices should trend higher over the next few years. And you'll notice that the cattle segments are gaining um, on the wholesale dollar. So the macro message again is that prices should be trending higher. And so with that, um, as we start to um, put more jingle in the cow-calf producer's pocket, um, red cow prices should be increasing as well. Again, fewer cows out there. Um, and then hopefully folks uh, looking to expand, you know, that, sh that should likely result in higher uh, female prices. So anticipating uh, essentially $125 per head increase um, for bred cow prices for the next next year. Now, a thought would be is that, um, you know, certainly you know, mother nature limits our ability uh, to increase the cow herd, um, especially in terms of feed prices and forage availability. But as we head into the next few years of higher calf prices, uh, if there is opportunity to expand the cow herd, um, buying it, stepping into the female market sooner rather than later uh, would likely be the best call. Um, to capitalize on these higher calf prices um, that she'll have over her productive lifetime, or at least for the next few years. Um, because certainly, um, if prices are up next year, they'll likely continue to be higher for the next few years, and the cheaper females are here in front of us. And another thought, you know, is the value of adding weight and holding on to these cattle for longer. Now, um, as we think about uh, you know, this higher trend uh, over the next few years does also suggest that owning inventory longer uh, tends to be a better bet. Now, this chart illustrates um, over the past few years or over, um, over time, what's been the value of taking a weaned calf, 500 pound steer in October and adding 300 pounds uh, into the market in February. You know, over the past um, past few years, uh, from 2009 to 2020, the market would pay you $289 per head. And as you look towards, you know, in what the value increase is, you'll notice that these years that we're transitioning into tighter cattle supplies, uh, historically, tend to be towards the upper end of the range. So again, opportunities there in terms of, you know, if you can keep your cost of gain in line, um, the value of adding weight tends to work out uh, on top of the fact that just owning inventory longer into a higher trend uh, gives you a potential advantage there. Now, as we talked about, uh, beef demand you know, continues to increase, but I think it's really interesting as you break that down by quality grade. Uh, the, top, the top line in, in green looks at choice cutout demand you can see up 75% since 1998, clearly leading the charge that that's where the growth is happening in terms of beef demand. At the same time, select demand, you know, the trend line on here would suggest that not necessarily declining, but not certainly a whole lot better than treading water, uh, more or less flat. Certainly not the growth market uh, that this quality demand uh, <clears throat> is presenting us. And these value, uh, these value differences, premiums for quality, uh, just another way of looking at it, these are those average grid premiums um, for fed cattle. Those quality premiums continue to transition uh, through the cattle segments. Uh, and this looks at, you know, basis of choice, average animal. 
you can see the CAB premium, um, prime premium remains strong, uh, while the select uh, trends slightly softer uh, relative to choice. So simple message again is even though as we're continuing to produce more high quality cattle, they continue to garner a larger, larger premium. At the same time, again, you're also seeing these other value added programs um, that we're also moving more cattle into those buckets, whether it's all natural or NHTC um, or any of these other programs out there, uh, continue to, uh, to favor some value there as well. Now, on the calf side of things, you know, those premiums continue to trickle down there as well. Uh, this looks at data from Superior and I'd encourage you not to get too hung up in the exact numbers on these premiums. Um, but as you pay attention to the trends in general, as you look at things like, um, you know, the, the fairly basic things like being a good producer uh, or being a good producer, uh, those tend to show up here as well. And what I mean is, um, you know, not only do you have premiums for things like weaning, as we're seeing more weaned calves, we're still seeing a premium for those, or really more of a discount for unweaned calves. And at the same time, progressive genetics. So um, you know, representing those calves is coming from, um, from a verified you know, seed stock producer that's part of that program, continues to post, an e post some value as well. You know, just signifying to the buyer that, hey, I've invested in my genetics. And these things can account for things like you know, what's just the quality of the cattle? Um, continue to see things where, um, where higher quality cattle uh, gain higher prices. And again, as we also look at these other premium programs, the options that are out there, uh, and this data unfortunately ends uh, in 2020, um, but I would say that the trends remain into 2021 and going forward that um, NHTC premium remains pretty significant. Um, verified natural uh, continues to post an increase, whereas more commodity natural, um, not third party verified, yeah, slight premium, uh, but really the goodie comes with having those cattle uh, third party verified. So as we look back again, um, you know, really what to that uh, question that Kevin posed about what drives profitability. Um, every year, we, we also do a survey of cow-calf producers and really try to understand, you know, what differentiates um, what we classify as high return producers from lower return producers. And what we'll see is that these high return producers manage cost very carefully, you know, regardless of which type of market environment you're in, whether average profitability is high or low those producers tend to be um, you know, faring better than average. They manage costs very aggressively, but don't sacrifice a few things, animal health, nutrition, and genetics. And that's what our survey would show year in and year out. So as we think about you know, over the next few years, again, as I've outlined, prices should move, be moving higher. Um, cattle producer profitability will improve um, across the spectrum, but to really maximize on that, you know, thinking about how do we continue to remain in that high return producer uh, category to really capitalize the most on these higher trends over the next few years. So just to summarize a few thoughts in terms of marketing considerations, think about managing the, beef, the, the cow herd. Uh, if there's ways to increase inventory uh, here early in the cattle cycle, to have more cows to sell at higher prices. Or if that's not possible, what about, um, what about decreasing the average age of the cow herd? Um, so that way that, you know, say prices peak in 2025 and you have a young cow that's at the best for productive life at that time frame. Extending ownership, again, the larger price trend is higher. So can you own inventory longer into that? Um, options like, you know, backgrounding, retaining ownership, um, or winter or summer grazing, uh, depending on your resources there. Now, managing cost, again, critically important. We're moving into a higher cost environment. This inflation um, 
inflationary environment, feed grains, uh, our forecast is again that they don't necessarily move much, move higher from here, um, but still higher relative uh, to what we've been used to. Energy prices are up, and hey, what about interest rates? Um, as we do start to see the Fed potentially um, increase benchmark rates as we get deeper into spring. Again, as we talked about, premium programs um, are out there. It's really important to weigh those against you know, hey, there's a premium. But at what cost? Um, what's, it's not just the premium, but what's the cost benefit trade off there? Um, and these things, you know, again, premiums as we see are growing, but it's important to push the pencil. And there's, and what about the potential of you know, things that didn't pencil out in the past? Could they pencil out today? Uh, may not, but, uh, but this, these changing environments, these wide premiums, um, may make it worth at least reevaluating. And how about adjusting the risk management toolbox? Um, you know, if you use if you use futures um, to protect the value of your cattle, um, what about using options? Um, some way to continue to leave some more upside while still you know balancing all the unknowns out there. And it seems like these black swan events, these major hurdles, um, seem to happen more and more frequently, and the volatility is certainly higher as well. So, um, so looking at ways that we can still manage risk and still leave upside at the same time. And also things like LRP insurance uh, continue to offer, uh, especially with the increased premium subsidies, offer some good options for folks. At the end of the day, it is really important to also not let greed trump profitability. Um, over the next few years, again, uh, prices will be moving higher but you don't want to you know, be waiting for that very last dollar and then some sort of volatility happens. And even if it's just a blip in the market, but you have to sell your calves that week. And boy, I sure wish I would have priced them a month ago. Because um, sometimes you can miss out on 10 by waiting for one. And so it's important, again, to know your break even and keep in perspective of, you know, of, you know walking in price uh, when you know uh, when profitability uh, is to your targets. So that's what I have for today's presentation. Um, Drew, pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how many times I see a presentation from somebody at Cattle Facts. I'm always um, just completely blown away by y'all's ability to take a really complex market and make it make sense um, to those of us who aren't economists and traders um, in our daily lives. So really appreciate it everything that you've uh, done for us today. We've got a few questions and we'll have some conversation, I think, um, if that's all right with everybody. Again, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, but Patrick, you, you touched on this a little bit and I wanna start off, um, let's go back to beef on dairy. So as you're thinking about beef on dairy, from a traditional beef, just straight beef producer standpoint, what does beef on dairy and the changes that are coming in, in that regard, um, what does that look like in a meaningful way to the traditional beef producer, especially as we see beef on dairy animals start to grade higher, start to become more prevalent um, in terms of chain space and, and hook space and contracts, perform better in the feedlot, that sort of thing. Um, what, what does that do to the average, to the normal, just beef on beef producer? Oh, that's a that's a really good question, Drew, and one that we get all the time you know, as we start talking about that subject. And I think what's for me what's important to keep in mind is where we're at in terms of the cattle cycle. We are heading into tighter cattle supplies, and so um, you know where over the past few years I think we've tended to look at uh, you know that that dairy animal um, as a bit of a competition. It, it really shouldn't be over the next few years. And if anything, I think you know, two ways that, that that revolution may really benefit us. We're heading into tighter cattle supplies. And at the same time, we need to grow shackle space and grow packing capacity. So upgrading the quality um, of, those, um, of those beef cattle coming out of the dairy system provide some opportunity to help us, you know, continue to maintain some profitability at the packing segment. Um, so that again, that shackle space is there if we want to expand the cow herd in the latter half of the decade. 
Um, now also the other thing is from a demand standpoint, the quality of those cattle, you know, as you mentioned, it is so much better um, than a traditional, you know, straight Holstein beef steer. Um, so as we improve that, um, it, it again continues to improve the quality and consistency of U.S. beef, um, which over the long run you know, is, is what's improved the demand for our product. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I know I was at the Sustainable Ag Summit in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago and saw a really interesting presentation um, from some organizations working on beef on dairy genetics and some of the data that they were showing about the improvements that is happening, you know, generation over generation to how these animals are grading, how they're performing, um, you know, phenotypically in the feed yard, how they're performing in terms of, um, you know, at the, pro at the processing plant. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to watch this change generation by generation. So really looking forward to seeing what happens here. Um, we've got a question that just came in. We'll, we'll change gears a little bit. Hope you're, hope you're able to jump around. Um, what do you think the 2022 spring cash high will be for fats? And what do you anticipate the contract high to be for the August feeder cattle? I know that's a really specific question. So that is, that is very specific, but um, our, our over underline today, uh, we'll say that the spring high this in 2022 uh, is 150. Um, could be in the upper 140s, and you could make the case that it exceeds that into the low 150s. Um, really, again, that, that leverage dynamic, the cattle segments have quickly gained a higher percentage of the cutout over the past you know, two months. Where does that go from here? Uh, that'll really be dictating how high uh, the spring high is, but uh, plus or minus 150 is our benchmark today. Now, uh, in terms of the feeder complex to the other question, um, you know, the, the futures, um, well, to start off on the cash side of things, um, feeders, again, moving higher, uh, we would say that um, basically a one, 184, 185 is probably the high for, um, for the cash market next fall would be our expectation. So call it mid 180s. Whereas the past few years, plus or minus 160 has been the upper end of the range. Now, with that, to the question on the futures, um, futures, you know, so often can um, can swing higher or lower than the cash does. Um, so, you know, we would say that you know if cash gets to uh, mid 180s, the futures should at least by expiration. There's potential that you know. Could they exceed that at some point as futures, you know, are, are more volatile than the cash? Um, they could, but um, uh, I'll, we'll just stick to the, uh, the mid 180s as the cash expectation today. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we'll change gears here a little bit again, and we'll talk about um, premium programs, value added programs, you know, NHTC, uh, CAB, whatever it might be. Let's include them all. You know, a lot of times as producers are thinking about those programs and how their operation fits into that, um, it's a lot of upfront money and co cost <clears throat> for, you know, some return on investment down the line, whether that's a year, whether that's two years, whether that's five years. As producers are looking at the market over the next few years and they're looking at, at these value added programs and deciding, look, do I need to be a part of this program or that program? Is it worth changing? Is it worth doing something different? What are some considerations from an economic standpoint, from a market standpoint, that producers need to keep in mind while they're thinking about evaluating these value-added programs as right or wrong for their operation and their business? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. And again, something we need to keep in mind. The, the value for differentiation um, you know, continues to grow as we would see it. Um, and the programs um, that are out there continues to be more and more of them, um, both on kind of a, a small town local level, um, all the way up to these large programs um, you know, that are out there. Um, so, you know, to the producer out there, I would say just continue to push the pencil. Um, if it doesn't work, at, hasn't worked out for you in the past, again, maybe it does here today. Um, you know, if you're, you know, for instance, if you're um, not implanted uh, because you want to hit the NHTC mark, 
pencil out, you know, here's roughly, you know, what I think, what we think NHTC cabs are bringing, and here's the pounds um, that I'm giving up by not implanting. Um, again, some folks, um, some folks just being a really good commodity producer tends to be your forte, but there's a lot of opportunities out here, uh, you know, in terms of those premium programs. And, you know, just continue to push the pencil because you don't want to do a program um, that's not going to pay. But for a lot of folks, we are seeing where those, those value added programs are paying. And as we look on down the road, you know, as you mentioned, Drew, the sustainability conversation, um, that's going to continue to be huge. Um, are there you know, value added programs around sustainability, um, you know, including things like animal welfare, um, environmental sustainability, things like that. Um, and a lot of those will include a traceability component as well, likely, um, because again, to if you're gonna say it's sustainable or if you're gonna say it's natural, we need to prove it um, for the market to pay you to do that. So continue to watch out for, you know, for these new programs that, um, that may fit your niche. Um, some of them won't, but, um, but likely some of them, some of them may. Yeah, that's a really good point on traceability, Patrick. You know, as we look at the future and how things are changing around sustainability, you know, third party audits and verification, that's always historically been seen as, you know, such a pain, such a hassle, such a, you know, added cost. Um, but we've really got to start looking at that as the doorway to some of these emerging programs and emerging, um, you know, value add opportunities, especially longer term, um, three, four or five years down the road when, um, whether it's processors, packers, retail brands or companies are looking for cattle that have been produced in a specific way, whether that's, you know, environmentally, like you mentioned, or animal wellness or whatever the case may be, um, you know, traceability and, and auditing and verification is just gonna have to be a part of that conversation. and so the faster and the, the more effectively we can help producers deal with that and, and come to terms with that and figure out how to make that work on their operation. I think the, the faster they'll be able to turn and, and get into those programs. Um, we're gonna do one more question and unless anyone else uh, watching has anything, drop it in the chat. Um, Patrick, as we're, as we're thinking about, um, you know, your closing, your closing line was basically don't let greed trump profit, know your break even. Um, as producers are thinking about how they can improve their operation or improve their business um, over the next year, over the next coming years, um, what are some recommendations that you have from an economic standpoint, from a market standpoint, in terms of places to look, um, whether that's for cutting cost or for capturing value, capturing revenue? Um, are there specific areas that you're seeing that are you know, really easy to, to slim down cost on or, or a first place to start. Um, and on the backside, are there low hanging fruit in terms of what these are things you can do to help your, um, your cash flow in the short term? Yeah, and, I, and I'll actually, you know, flip my answer a little bit, um, you know, and start off on the revenue side. You know, we, we've talked about that a bit and, you know, our, the outlook is that in prices should be trending higher. So, on average, your revenue side should be improving for the next few years. Um, and we've talked on a few things that you can do to, to try to improve the revenue side of things, you know, in terms of, again, risk management, balancing profitability with, um, you know, with the fact that it's just a volatile world and you wanna manage risk. Uh, again, value added opportunities, um, you know, in terms of different programs, and then things like, again, adding weight or um, can you somehow increase your production so you have more pounds of more pounds of animal to sell over the next few years? Now, to the cost side of your question, um, really, it's it it really comes down to what what fits your operation. And, and unfortunately, there is a no one size fits all. Um, you know, managing feed costs um, is very important. Um, you know, looking for ways to manage that, even energy costs, um, you know, things like that, you know, as much as you can manage energy and fuel. Again, as we said, interest rates, um, they will be going higher. The, the cost of money has been so cheap for the last 10 years. Um, you know, probably not going to see, you know, double digit, um, you know, interest rates plus, you know, above 10%, but 
likely higher than what we've been used to. So be on the lookout for things like that. Um, it does seem like, you know, continuing to find better ways to manage your grazing resources. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of folks, you know, over the past several decades have gotten a lot better at managing that grazing resource. We don't see folks overgrazing as much as we did, you know, call it, call it 40, 50 years ago. Um, and so continuing to find more innovative grazing practices, ways to manage that grazing resource, because that is your cheapest feed cost and uh, cheapest feed resource. So if you can maximize what you're getting out of that over the long term, um, that's huge. Um, and then again, just looking for ways that uh, can you can you increase the uh, the pounds of weaned calf that you're getting off the ranch, whether that's continuing to wean a heavier calf or again finding ways to graze more innovatively to to be able to run just a few more cows on that same grazing resource. Really, not a one size fits all, but just trying to check the boxes on you know managing costs where you can and increasing revenues where you can. Unfortunately, it's not a cookie cutter answer. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. We understand that. Um, Kevin, I think yeah. you had a question you wanted to throw out. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Patrick. That was a fascinating presentation and some really interesting insight there. Um, one thing I noticed was, you know, there are some, you know, there, there's a lot going on, some positive, some negative, but there are some big macro trends that it seemed like cattle facts believe are going in the right direction, you know, increasing consumer demand, increasing prices available. Um, but one uh, chart that really jumped out at me was was on the margins and how the margins you know, have gone up dramatically in some ways, but so much of it was getting consumed by the packers uh, over the past several years. And uh, on our, our survey of ranchers, one of their biggest concerns, I think their third biggest concern was around packers and packer consolidation. So I was wondering if you could just touch on that, your thoughts on that, and I guess what ranchers can do to put themselves in a position to consume more of that margin. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that's been a real key issue. The, you know, the demand has been there, but unfortunately, just the, the demand, if you want to say the demand for fed cattle hasn't been the same as the demand for beef because of that bottleneck that we've seen at the packing side. Um, you know, so over the next few years, you know, really, if you can be a champion uh, of increasing, you know, these packing, you know, the packing um, capacity and, you know, encouraging, yeah, which, yeah, there's only so much an individual can do, but, um, you know, if you want to get into the packing space, I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough uh, space to get into. Uh, but, you know, you have seen a lot of these small sized plants, um, you know, local shops um, opening up and increasing their capacity. Um, you know, whether it's a regulatory environment, um, you know, talking to regulators or, um, or legislators, encouraging that there's a clear path for these new, for these expansions to occur. Um, you know, those are important things um, because, again, there, there's so many of these announcements out there um, that over the next few years, again, our, our rough guess is let's just say half of them actually happen. And you could you saw in the chart how how dramatic of an increase that is if just half of them come to fruition. Um, so, you know, so that. Uh, that packing capacity relative to cattle supplies um, should be moving in our favor in the next few years as well. And, and it's important that we do see that happen um, because that's you know, clearly reflected in your survey that, um, yeah. that, that that has been a challenge. So you do see that bottleneck starting to clear up in the next couple of years. Yeah, but based Hopefully. on our, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it's important again that these, these expansions take place, but even if we don't, you know, we will be having um, tighter cattle supplies for the next few years. So that lever will be moving in our favor. The longer term, it's important that we do see, you know, that increase in packing capacity to be a growth industry um, over the next, call it 10 years. Absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Patrick, if you can stop sharing your screen, um, I'll take us home with just a, a couple slides on uh, what we're up to over on the trust in beef side. 
Um, so as I mentioned during my intro, Trust in Beef is a new program um, led by Trust in Food, which is a division of Farm Journal that is designed to help producers deal with a changing world, um, specifically as it relates to um, conservation and sustainability. Um, so Trust in Beef is a program that we're launching this year to help beef producers deal with a changing world and what, how that relates to their operation in terms of sustainability and regenerative. Um, so as you're looking at drovers and as you're looking at Farm Journal material over the next year and you see us out there, um, that's what we're doing. Um, Trust in Beef is going to equip producers uh, to be able to sort a sustainable future into their operation. We're going to provide producers with information, education, access to the tools and access to the resources that they need in order to make decisions for their operations um, that make sense from a sustainability, from a regenerative and a conservation standpoint. Um, and then we're gonna provide them with the boots on the ground support that they need to make those changes happen on their operation. Um, so uh, not a lot else to say today, other than that, as you look at, look at your operation in 2022 and you see the Trust in Beef brand in the market, um, that's what we're there doing. We're there to serve the producer and help them be able to make the changes that they need to change to adapt um, to a changing world. Um, so with that, Kevin, Patrick, any final words? Um, otherwise, we might call it a day. I guess one, maybe one quick question for you, Drew. Um, you know, you talked earlier, and, and I agree furiously about that cost of change. Um, you know, there's the ongoing costs that Patrick referenced, but there's also that sort of initial getting over the hump of getting started. And, um, you know, how have you seen that improve or, or what can producers do to kind of get through that phase um, to, to get, get to the value side of it? Yeah, the, the hard answer is that if an operation doesn't have the cash or the credit or the capital to make a change, they don't have the cash or the credit or the capital to make a change, right? They have to find outside resources and support, whether that's USDA, whether that's private programs, you know, nonprofits, environmental groups, um, you know, uh, value add premium products or whatever. Um, there has to be some sort of a bridge to the change on the operation because producers are operating at such slim margins and, you know, things are what they are financially, um, not just for beef operations, but for agriculture in general right now. So if, if the, the barrier is, you know, financial or cost, um, we've got to figure out what a bridge is to get over that. And that has to come, typically has to come from outside support or has to come from somewhere. Um, now that's not to say that that, that cost is, should, is or should be covered, um, you know, for all time, right? We want producers to get to a place where they're getting a higher price for their products because of the way that they're producing it. They have a lower um, overhead, their costs, their production costs are lower, so their, their books are better on the back end. Um, but there's the, the simple answer is there's gotta be a bridge and it's gotta come from somewhere. Um, and we recognize that that bridge sometimes is, is easy to find, right? Um, and other times it's not as easy to find. So for operations who are looking at the future um, and are looking to change, if, if the capital and the cash and the credit to start to make change is a real, is going to be a barrier for you, start to think about what are some options to get around that, whether that's federal programs, um, nonprofit programs, you know, other environmental groups that are out there, grants, things like that. Awesome, thank you. Well, if there's no other questions from the audience and Patrick and Kevin, y'all don't have any other closing remarks, I think um, that might be it. Please check the chat and stay tuned for um, any follow-up. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Patrick. Bye. Have a good one.